Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so, as I kind of get into this, let's make sure my phone. Oh, I don't even have my phone. Great. Um, good start, Leah. Um, so when I was thinking about this lecture, I've thought about this a lot. It's something I've been playing with in my acting classes. I think we have overcomplicated acting. We've overcomplicated it to such a degree that it seems like something that stands outside of you or something that, especially in academics, we have done everything in our power to make classical work as inaccessible as humanly possible. If you say to a young actor, we're going to do Shakespeare, uncut the whole thing. We're going to do a four-hour Hamlet. Their buttholes clench <laughs> instantly, right? They get remarkably fearful because it seems as if you have to be very intelligent to do Shakespeare's work, very intelligent to understand the work of Euripides or Sophocles or any of the Grecians. Um, that's because we in academia have done that purposefully. I have a theory that in theater, we want ourselves to be something more than just people playing pretend, because that's too easy. It makes us very childlike. It makes us so that you wouldn't take us seriously because we're not academic and scholarly enough about it. So we really enjoy feeling like, oh, I know all of the references in Shakespeare's work. It's like, well, good for you. I'm glad you can read. <laughs> My point of all of this is, is that I don't think you do need, now some people are going to disagree with me on this. I don't think you need to have a clear understanding of iambic to understand Shakespeare's work. You do not need a clear understanding of all Greek and Roman mythology, because that's literally all they talk about, to understand any Grecian tragedy. None of that is necessary. In fact, I would argue you don't have to research shit. Not one thing. Because everything that you need is contained in the script. All of it. You wouldn't need to, and I, I know this to a certain degree, because it's how I started acting. I didn't have an acting coach till I was like 12 or 13. Um, which is crazy that I had an acting coach at all. Um, I didn't have any of those things. All I had were these like goodwill scripts that, and they were crazy, right? The, the, I read Long Day's Journey Into Night in the seventh grade. and was like, this is amazing. It tells you how weird I was. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing because I can't wait to play Mary Tyrone. Today, I'm just waiting to get older so that I can play Mary Tyrone because I want to have a morphine addiction on stage. <laughs> and there's this beautiful scene where she comes down the staircase and she looks like a ghost and I like have dreamed about it. Anyway, um, I read Medea in the eighth grade. I found the script. It was Euripides' Medea. I found the script in a giveaway bin at Elkview Middle School Library. Um, I knew nothing about Greek mythology. I mean nothing. I had never had a class where we focused on Greek mythology. I had never had, I mean nothing throughout my entire public education. Until I got to undergrad and graduate school, I didn't know shit about the Greeks. But I understood Medea instantly. I didn't know anything about Colchis. I had no idea about Jason and the Argonauts. I knew none of I had no idea about all the tasks Jason had to complete in order to get the Golden Fleece. I didn't even know about the Golden Fleece. I had no idea what any of it was about because all of it was contained in the script. When Shakespeare wrote Merry Wives of Windsor, he didn't also write a companion text so you can understand the Merry Wives of Windsor. The same thing is true for Julius Caesar. The same thing is true for any single other of Shakespeare's works. There was no companion text. Additionally, modern audiences and actors are more educated than any single generation in the history of the world. Yet young actors are still afraid of this. Fair, interesting, kind of on the same page. Um, so what I'd like to first start with um, is that I'll say to young actors or young students, sorry, is that me? That's devastating. Uh, um, great, I'm glad I heard my voice today. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I'll often say to young actors or newer actors, how does the playwright speak to us? Especially if that playwright is big dead, right? You can't go, right now you could go ask Susan Laurie Parks or you could go ask Paula Vogel something and they would have some you know, artistic answer for you. But in general, once they're gone, we can't ask them anything. So they speak to us in other ways. They speak to us in the stage directions. And you'll notice, in Shakespeare's work and in Grecian tragedies, there are very few stage directions. Historically, there's a reason for that. For Shakespeare's work, it was that typically actors were given only their part. 
So they weren't really super aware of what any of the rest of the play was about. You would get one scene that's between the two of you, and then you would find out what the rest of the play was about whenever you went to the one or two rehearsals that you had before people came into the Globe to see your work. So we know that they didn't have the kind of context that we have now. Also, these playwrights typically directed their own pieces. So they didn't really need to write down, you cross downstage left and smack her in the face. <laughs> why am I, why? They're always violent. Every time I explain something about where actors go on stage, it's always like, you go down there and you punch her. And it's like, why? They could have hugged Leah. Um, anyway, <laughs> the director would just literally tell you that and you would go there. So it was far more about that interaction of director and actor. Now, actors are responsible for so much of the work that goes into before you even see me on stage. You all have to do the kind of work I'm talking about that actually was never done in Grecian times and was never done in Shakespeare's work. Neither, there, wasn't table, there wasn't a table read for The Tempest, right? They got on stage and they had to do their parts the way it was in a couple of days. But you have far more than they had because one, you have Google, so if you get in the shit, you can Google it. But in general, everything you need is on the page. So I often say, there's a har I have a horrible religious analogy for understanding the hierarchy of a, a theatrical production. I use this all the time in my classes. It goes over well sometimes. Um, but if you want to think about it this way, the playwright is God. The playwright creates the world. It all begins and ends with the playwright. Were it not for the script, we would have nothing. So if the playwright is God, this is really gonna hurt, the director is Jesus. I laugh about that because I am a director. Um, you can tell why people in West Virginia are often like, this is the analogy, but it makes sense. Um, also, if you're wondering, the apostles are the technical crew and the actors. Anyway. <laughs> It's interesting to think about it that way because it gives you an understanding of what your job is. If, the, if God is the playwright, the script is the Bible. We all serve the script. In Christianity, we all serve God. We all serve the playwright. Does that kind of make sense? That's why I, I warn people it's a horrible analogy, so if you're religious, just know it is just an understanding of this. <laughs> It is not any kind of comment about religion. Um, just so we're on the same page, because I definitely got a response about that on one of my student responses at my job. Um, I have continued to use it. Screw that kid. Um, horrible. But if the playwright is God, then you start, everything begins and ends with the play, which means script analysis is the most important thing that you can do. It doesn't require anything else. It doesn't require a conversation between two actors. It doesn't require you to go to the director and go, what am I doing here? You can start making some of those decisions for yourself in your script before you ever meet them. One of my largest, the things I hate the most is that directing for a number of people has become about having puppets on stage that you move around, right? They'll want you to go, you're gonna go downstage left, not punch someone in the face, you're gonna pick up this glass, put it down two times, turn to your left, it, it becomes, that's my right. Um, I am a professor, um, medium. Anyway, that kind of micromanaging is done because actors aren't making choices. When it comes down to it and you're the director, you have a timeline. You're also getting paid. You are responsible for a large amount of this show. At a certain point, you don't have time to guide your actors. We know that in community theater. We know that in educational theater, professional theater. And just so you know, theaters are shutting down left and right. This market's gonna be saturated with actors and directors. And the one thing that I say to my youngest actors, you have to be better than them. And the only way I can think you do that is you come in with a clear understanding of what the hell it is you wanna do. Because the director is responsible for the global understanding of the play. I have to understand everything. I have to understand all of your intricate relationships. The actor doesn't have to worry about that. You're responsible for the world of your character. So if you come in already having picked these teeny tiny little things out of text, out of ancient text for Christ's sake, then you can do something active when you're up there. So I start, I go back to basics, right? We've overcomplicated theater. It's not that hard, we pretend for a living I get annoyed, I'll hear, young actors will often say, it's hard. 
And my favorite response is the response Gene Anthony gave to me when I said that to him, in which he screamed at me, cancer is hard. <laughs> but he was right, right? He is right, cancer is much harder than acting, full stop. But it helped place acting where it belongs. It helped place what we do exactly where it belongs so that there's a sense of play inherent in what we do. If it's not just pretending, then it's like this emotional slog through all of these feelings. It's like, you don't have to do any of that shit. All you have to do is pretend. And worse, you have to believe it. That's what makes us a little off kilter, really. Like when we believe our own bullshit, that's how you sell a character on stage. So if we go back to basics, I start with Freytag's pyramid. You're all aware of Freytag's pyramid, which is this. It's a pyramid, right? It goes blah, 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 blah. it's a pyramid. It starts out with exposition. So right, everything that came before. So I, I bring up exposition because in every single Grecian tragedy and the comedies, really, the very first scene is exposition. It's typically a slave or messenger character who will tell you everything that happened beforehand. I'm gonna use Medea as my example because it is my favorite play. Joanna played her um, really well. Uh, um, probably, probably one of my favorite plays I've ever directed, honestly. It was a gorgeous production. But I'm obsessed with Medea, which says so much about me. Um, but something I, I, I wanna bring up of all of the things that you can find just by using Frey Tax Pyramid. This is the pyramid that we teach in middle school for understanding story structure. So instead of getting into the shit of table work and what does he mean here and there, all you have to do is follow Freytag's pyramid and all of your questions will be answered. So for example, in, well, I gotta find where I am. So if we're talking about the nurse, the nurse plays a huge role in Medea. She, Medea literally suckled at the nurse's breast. It's like her mom, you know, her she's left her entire family, betrayed everyone she has known for a dude. So already she has a couple of points against her. We find out all of this exposition about Jason and the Argonauts. We find out that Medea, that Medea helped him finish these three tasks so he could get the Golden Fleece. We find out all of this information within the first five minutes of the play. It sets up the scene for all of us. And da -da -da, chopped her brother up into little pieces. That's a good note, Leah. Um, the interesting thing about all of that is in general, when you think about, I mean, even in Shakespeare's work, there's a lot of exposition that comes in that you don't know anything about. Especially, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things we leave to the imagination. And contemporarily, exposition is sliced in here and there so that you figure it out at the end, right? But exposition here in, in classic literature, classic theater, that kind of exposition gives you exactly where you're starting. This is your starting point. Here's how, where the characters are. So we find out immediately, Medea has been betrayed by her husband. A young, sweet little chippy is now his new bitch. We hate her. We find all of this out and it gives us already, we already know what Medea is. We find out immediately she is vengeance. Medea is vengeance. We find that out in the first three seconds. We also find out that the nurse, despite all of the things that Medea has done, up until this point, she chops her brother up into little pieces, throws his body pieces out into the ocean. She has betrayed her entire family. She kidnapped her brother before she chopped him up, so that's messed up too. All of these awful things have happened, yet the nurse does not condemn Medea. In that exposition and the understanding of that story, not once does she say, Medea's a bitch. Not once. Instead, she pours empathy over this woman. She spends the entire thing telling us what a piece of shit Medea has been, only to then go praying to the gods, begging them to help her. So if Medea is vengeance, the nurse is empathy. And if you start thinking of it in these stock character terms, especially in Grecian tragedy, and I mean, especially in Shakespeare's work, so much of it is informed by Commedia dell'arte, which is an Italian form of theater and the stock characters and it's slapstick. Anyway, um, I like Commedia dell'arte. I just seem like I hate it for like five minutes. Um, you should watch that version of Taming of the Shrew that's done in the style of Commedia dell'arte. I believe it's like a 1970s version. I'll send it to all of you, actually, because it's that good. 
Anyway, if we start thinking of these stock characters that you're finding in the exposition, the nurse gives us this information. Now we have an understanding of where the conflict exists. We have an understanding of who Medea is against. We have an understanding of who is on her team. And this is in the first paragraph of the entire play. Not a bit of research is needed to understand any of that. If you hear that story of what has happened to Medea and you don't think, I'd be pissed too. That's how, that's what you play. You can play if Medea is vengeance. You can play that all day. There's no, what does she want? What does she need? She wants revenge. Full stop. And anything else that gets in the way, it's gotta go, including her own children. Because she is vengeance. The same is true for the nurse. The nurse is empathy. At the end, when Medea kills her kids, the nurse doesn't go, you bitch. She doesn't beat the shit out of her outside of Corinth. Instead, the nurse bemoans what has happened. She is just as broken as Medea. Well, Medea flies off on a chariot pulled by dragons, so she's pretty fine. She is, and she is our reflection. There's always someone in the play that is a reflection. I, there's a chorus in every play, regardless of if there's a chorus in every play. There is a moral compass for every single play you see, a singular character who is responsible for the moral compass of that show. In Medea, it is the nurse. And throughout the entire play, she plays that exact thing. She never once gets angry. She never once condemns. She didn't steal the kids and like run away. She stays the entire time. Again, all of that is within the first paragraph of the play. And I've Googled nothing at this point. Kind of make sense? So then if you kind of keep that idea going, you go to inciting incident. I, I always go back to inciting incident because it's easy to grasp. It's the thing that were it not for X situation, none of this play would happen. If it were not for Creon coming to Medea and saying, you and your kids, get out. Actually, get out right now, because that's initially what he does. She says, just give me until sundown. I promise you, I, I put it all together until sundown. And he says, what can she do in the tale of one day? Which kicks off the whole thing, because the whole play is what the hell she can do in the tale of one day. So if the inciting incident is when he says that, Creon's actually the first person whose opinion we hear of Medea. He is the most powerful person we understand. So, so far, we have heard from the nurse. We hear from the tutor. The children have a tutor. Uh, we hear from the women of Corinth, which is the, the chorus of the play. But in terms of hierarchy, Medea is above all of them. One of my favorite, my very favorite script analysis techniques is what do the other characters say about you? What does the playwright say about you? He often talks to you in stage directions. And what do you say about you? And if you identify those, you have a global perspective of your character. You understand instantly who you're against and who you're for. Because over and over again, every single person in the play says, Medea is dangerous. Medea is a witch. We should be afraid of Medea. Everybody, including the nurse. Everyone says that about her. If everyone says that about her, she says it about herself, by the way. She does like a whole damn spell in the middle of the thing. She said, you want me to prove I'm a witch? Here you go. Everyone says that about her, which will bring us to the central conflict. It's not Medea against Jason. That's what you would think, right? Jason's the one who did all this shit to her. It's not Medea against Jason. It's Medea against everyone. No one stands in her way. Again, Medea is vengeance. And if she is vengeance, we are only, everything she does in the play is only to serve her revenge. The inciting incident and what other characters say about us tells us about ourselves. Does that speak your language? Yes, kind of, no? Mm -hmm. um, I use it all the time because you can use it in anything you do to find out who is against who. If you get down to the central conflict of a doll's house, you will find out it's about Nora and Torvald. If you get down to the central conflict of cat on a hot tin roof, it's about Maggie and Brick. That is the central conflict. And once you know what the central conflict is, it's easier for actors, because you can get rid of some of the other shit you're worried about. 
If the central conflict is between my and uh, uh, Joanna's character, right, and Kristen says some sideways shit in the play, most actors, we give everything the same amount of weight. That doesn't make any damn sense. If the conflict is between she and I, why am I giving her as much energy as I give this one? Because you can break it down techni technically, almost mathematically. If Joanna's a 10, I give her my 10, right? If Kristen's a five in terms of this conflict, why would I give her a 10? Because now we're starting to understand the hierarchy of these characters. Does that speak your language? So once you find the central conflict, which is typically a part of the inciting incident, you now know the importance of characters to your character. Because Shakespeare specifically, but definitely the Grecians, love a side story. We love to take you a place, and then out of nowhere, scene five is like this whole other town with people we've never met before. And suddenly, you have to pay attention to this shit. Well, if you're the actor playing this, if it's a five second scene and doesn't involve the, con the central conflict of the play, it doesn't deserve a 10. It deserves to be where it falls within the central conflict for your character. Does that speak your language? Interesting, no, kind of? Great. <laughs> um, so then the next thing I, I move into would be rising action. The rising action of Medea is Aegis. Uh, Aegis is the ruler of Thebes, and Aegis is having a problem knocking up his wife. Can't get her pregnant, he needs a child. And Aegis says to Medea, the worst thing I can imagine is not having children. They are a man's legacy. They are your immortality. Your children are your immortality. And so Medea goes, light bulb moment. I'll take away his kids. That is a rough, that's painful. But again, if Medea is vengeance, she can be con conflicted about this, right? She can have a feeling of like, oh no, should I do it, should I not? She's gonna do it the whole time. I don't know that Medea wavers ever. You have to ask yourself the question of who is she doing this stuff for? Who is she acting for? Is she saying, oh, I don't know, <laughs> what should I do, gods, please? The whole time she was gonna kill the kids. She is vengeance. So she doesn't have a choice but to kill the kids. So this idea that Medea is actually conflicted doesn't serve the central conflict as much as it would be if Medea was playing all of these people. That she was saying to the women of Corinth, I don't want to. <laughs> That's a tactic. Instead of Medea wrestling with should I do it, should I not, we know she's gonna do it the whole time. She knows she's gonna do it the second she has. I'm sorry I'm acting like you're Medea. Um, <laughs> this is Joanna, she's killed zero children. Um, <laughs> as of yet. I mean, I'm on your team. Whatever you think, I agree with. Um, Ugh. Suffering, revenge, yada yada. <laughs> I've gone over this so many times that sometimes I'm just like, oh, I'll get to the next part. So now you have your rising action, right? That is just building us up to what the climax is. The climax is the hardest thing to find. <laughs> um, is the hardest thing for men to do. Um, anyway, that's a nightmare. The climax is the hardest thing to find in the play because it, it seems like it's easy to understand. It seems like Medea killing the kids is the climax of the play. It's the most shocking thing that happens. But if you take a backwards perspective, I do this all the time, where I will tell my students, find what you believe the climax is. Find that. And then you work away from on either side. If you find that, the other ones are easy to find, and you know where you're going. You know what hill you're climbing. You know when it goes down. If you look at it literally as the pyramid we're talking about, right? Now, if you find that climax, everything else is easy because you know what you're building toward. Most of the time, actors have a very hard time understanding what they're building toward, often because we do not think about the climax at all because it seems evident. Unfortunately, the climax of Medea is not the killing of the kids. That's the most shocking part of what she does. But in truth, that's the resolution of the play. How does she solve her vengeance? What is the ultimate thing she wants? Vengeance and revenge, right? That's what she wants. 
so it's over when she gets what she wants. That's what we know about acting from the beginning. Actors, the first question I ask you is, what does your character want? It's my first question. The next question is, and when is it resolved? Because it is resolved in one way or the other. There are no plays that don't have a beginning, middle, end. There are no plays that do not follow Freytag's pyramid. We know that because for ages, playwrights have tried it. All the absurdist playwrights were like, I'm gonna write a play that doesn't follow shit, and it does naturally. No matter what they do, Seinfeld, a, pl a show about nothing, it's supposed to be a TV show about nothing. It was always about something. There was always a beginning, middle, and end. There was always a climax. There's always an inciting incident. There's always a re resolution, and there's always a denouement. Every single time. So if you find the climax, the other ones are easy as hell to find. The climax of Medea is when she kills Glaus and Creon. Because until that moment, nothing violent has taken place. Nothing. Medea said some rude shit. <laughs> She has just wished death upon every single person in existence, but no violence has taken place. She's done nothing. It isn't until the messenger, because it's always a messenger, it isn't until a messenger comes running in and says to Medea, girl, get out. You got to go, the whole city is coming for your ass. Because what Medea does, if you don't know, is she sends the little chippy, the little side piece of Jason, sends a crown and this beautiful gold like cloak and the second that Glaus puts it on her head it stabs into the skull of the princess and begins melting her and fire happens the same thing is true of the cloak the cloak wraps around and literally burns this bitch to the ground at the end she is a pile of rubble and her dad is like, no, baby, <laughs> king of Corinth. <laughs> and like an idiot, he hugs her. And as he hugs her, he becomes engulfed in flames. It's remarkably tragic. And the worst part is, we don't know anything about this. We, as actor, the characters in the play, as the audience, we know nothing about what Medea has planned. All we know is she has sent remarkably important gifts her little children in their little hands take the gifts to the princess to beg the princess to let us stay in the castle. And we think, she's gonna be okay. She's gonna try this, she can go with Aegis, because we know about Aegis by now. They're every single opportunity that Medea has to get herself out of this, and she turns the exact other way. So the climax of the play is the murder of Creon and Glaus, which then means there are only a couple other things we have to figure out. If we know what the resolution is, Medea kills her kids, the falling action is the next thing you pay attention to. The falling action is Medea resolving to kill her kids. It's an entire monologue where she basically says, I have no choice. If I want vengeance upon Jason, the only way to do that, I mean, she's already killed his, his side piece and the king of Corinth. Like, riots are happening in the streets. Medea's done all of that. She sits down, she has like this conversation with the gods and resolves at the end, I'm gonna do it. The actual murder of the kids is the resolution of the play. That's the resolution. She finally got what she wanted. Then there's this little bitty piece that I love the most, mostly because it's a French word and when I say it, people are like, you're smart. Uh, remember when I said actors wish we were smart? That's part of this. Uh, denouement is the resolution to the resolution which means it's like the period at the end of the sentence. Um, in terms of Seinfeld, it's when the credits roll and we're seeing a continuation of a joke we saw earlier in the show. That's the denouement. In Friends, it's like Phoebe says something outrageous while the credits roll, right? Like, that's the denouement. The denouement of Medea is Jason's lament at the end. Medea won't let, I know. <laughs> let it go, Leah. It was a very long time ago. <laughs> a very long time ago. Um, and I obviously let go of things super easy. I'm not a grudge holder at all. Um, I hold a grudge till death. Uh, and I am peppermint petty. I am petty. Anyway, so the denouement is everything that happens to Jason afterward, too. Because what you find out in the larger original Euripides version that is not a translation, we find out that Jason <laughs> lives out his days lonely, sad, 
unbelievably depressed until his own ship, the Argo, a, a mast breaks off, smashes him on the head, and he dies. Jason has a horrible ending. What happens to Medea? Bitch ascends to Mount Olympus in a chariot pulled by dragons. That's how you know she's the hero of the play. Now, people are often conflicted about Medea. Uh, just so on the same page, I'm not advocating child murder. Um, well, <laughs> which kids are we talking about? Um, <laughs> the thing I like about the play, the thing that, that I come back to over and over again, and it's something that ends up happening much, much later when we get to like The Sopranos and Breaking Bad, that this was started in Greece long before we started giving shitty characters leading roles and making them people we sympathize and empathize with. Because Tony Soprano was that first contemporary character where people were paying to watch HBO to watch a mobster do terrible things and then go to therapy and they were like, Tony. Right, we felt really bad for him. Um, same thing is true of Breaking Bad. It's interesting because Breaking Bad is a very interesting uh, show because the wife who everyone hates, if you've ever watched Breaking Bad, everyone hates the wife. She is the worst, she is annoying AF. However, she's right the entire time. The entire time, she is the moral compass of the entire show and we hate her. We hate her. All of this starts in Grecian theater of what is essentially an anti-hero. Do you know what I mean? That Medea, there are times when you watch the show, you sympathize with her, you empathize with her. And there are a couple times where you're like, maybe she should kill the kids. Maybe it would make things better. It's that kind of, this kind of script analysis that is probably the leanest, easiest, straightforward script analysis. If you buy a script analysis book, you will be sad. <laughs> they are exhausting. They're 500 pages of horse shit so that somebody feels like they wrote something and then my kids have to buy it for my stupid class. Do you know what I mean? It's nonsense. But Freytag's Pyramid's been around since you were in middle school. You can use it all day long to understand where your character fits within the global understanding of the play. It will also tell you so much like your energy levels. At your climax, you're at a 10. You can't go to the climax of the play being like, I guess. I guess we'll kill Glaus and Creon. No, she has to go full tilt. The messenger who says that speech has to make that devastating for us. You can't undercut the climax. In the same way that you can't give all, you can't give a 10 at the start of the play. You have nowhere to go. If you start the play at a 10 and you end the play at a 10, you ain't doing shit. It's the same thing throughout. If instead you're varying the energy levels based upon the pyramid, you have a clear and even way to go. And you also give your other actors an opportunity to fit in. If your personal climax in the play is the killing of the kids, right? Which will make sense. There's a global understanding of the play, and then there's a character-based understanding of the play. I tell all of my characters, what is your, all well, my actors, what is your character's climax? Because that's what you're working toward, and that's what you're falling away from. And if you don't know that, then you don't understand the play really at all. It's just kind of this amorphous, sometimes I feel this way. It's like, well, no one pays money to see your feelings. We want to see a play. There's a story structure. And it's also comforting for us as an audience. One of the great things that theater does is this a sense of catharsis, right? That you get to live vicariously through these people on stage. You get to have an emotional reaction to something that is not real. Yes, kind of. And so when we do that, we're giving our audiences an opportunity to breathe because the stakes are very low. These people aren't real. You can love them, you can hate them, you can wish death upon them. They die every night at curtain. We resurrect them the next damn day. So the stakes are very low and becomes a place for us to work out these remarkably complex feelings that if you work them out in real life, have consequences, kind of. And so the audience is expecting something from you. They're expecting a story structure that they know. It's one of the reasons people are often interested, like when they see new theater, they're not as weird, right? They know there's gonna be a beginning, a middle, and an end. They know that somewhere something's gonna pop off. That's your inciting incident. They know at some point some big event is going to happen. That's the climax. Naturally, audiences 
are waiting for you to take them on that journey. And when a play doesn't follow that journey, either because the direction was weird or the actors didn't get it, we know something is wrong. We as an audience, we can't pinpoint it. We can't go, mm, they don't understand the story. We go, that was a bad play. That's how we interpret that. Yes? Let me show you some of my nonsense. So, I mark up my scripts insanely. And so what I've done is taken some of these things. So Medea is in here. A uh, scene from Antigone is in here. And a monologue from Mary Wives. Leah. Yes. Oh, thank you. Look at your sweatshirt. I didn't know you guys had sweatshirts. In mustard? <laughs> Merch. Doing it. They're only how much? <laughs> They're only $35. Alchemy Theater Proof. I don't know what their fucking website is. I don't know what the website is. <laughs> yeah, you gotta come there online. So, um, so what I've done here is literally, I only did 15. <laughs> Sorry, they're weirdly, they're weirdly stacked from the thing. Um, so what I've done is gone through how I mark a script. So sometimes it's just underlines. Anytime something is circled, that is a vocal or physical characterization. So if you look at the Medea script, if you go down to the very bottom, the tutor's first line, old handmaid of my lady, why are you here alone moaning to yourself? We know the age of the nurse. We know her vocal quality in that opening monologue. She's moaning. We also know that she's by herself. Before you've ever hit stage with a rehearsal for a director, you know, based on this, if you're the nurse, you start the show. And not only that, you're crying to the gods because we find out in the next page, when the nurse replies, old woman attendant to Jason's son, good servants feel their master's pain. We also now know both of their jobs. We know what they do respectively. If you're an audience member, we've just told you, this bitch is the nurse, this one over here is the tutor. They're both old, and prior to, the nurse is screaming to the gods. It's not a direct address. She's not looking at you guys and being like, listen, here's what's up with Medea. She is screaming and crying to the gods, look what has happened to my lovely Medea. So you've gotten vocal and physical qualities, we are a page into the script, and we already know more information than we did before. And you didn't need to know anything about Greek mythology to find this out. It's right here. They'll also tell you where people go, where people enter and exit, when they should exit, because the nurse says, take the children inside. As long as we know where the hell inside is, the person playing the tutor goes, got it, and they go. Instead of a director going, and here's where you'll exit, upstage center, you would already know that because you read the damn script. Yes? Kind of? Um, I also go through, and I'll start, like, when you look at the tutor on page three of Medea, I never said anything. It sets up a hierarchy of the understanding of these two slaves because you find out very quickly that the nurse and the tutor are slaves, and the tutor is younger than the nurse. The tutor understands, can't say shit. I never said anything. And if anyone asks, I never said nothing. That's a character motivation. I never said anything is your first character motivation for the tutor. It says right away, this is secret information. If people find out I'm gossiping about this, what will happen to me? Be killed. Speaking your language? Um, I also, uh, something I, I, I think we read scripts wrong. I've thought of this a lot. I think we read scripts as we read novels. <coughs> novels are so much easier for us to grasp because if you're in this room, at least I know at least four or five of you are like huge Harry Potter fans. <laughs> and I mean, like, right, like I, I know you guys well. I'm a Slytherin. That can't be surprising. Um, that's right. Don't fuck around. Um, I know this because I, I know that a lot of you are avid readers. I know that, um, like, uh, who is it that does the Cindy Mac? Cindy Mac will always put, like, whatever 1,800 books she's read. Does she watch TV? Because, like, I don't think so. Um, I watch too much TV to read that much. I'm sorry. 
I'm also reading Game of Thrones right now, and it's amazing. Read it, it's so good. Um, I don't think he's finished it, though, so like, take your time. <laughs> um, but in terms of reading novels, novels are very linear, right? They have, they're just like anything else. They're very easy to follow, and they give it all to you. They say, the character was thinking this, <laughs> and then we go, that's what Harry thought, right? We know because they give it to us. In plays, the only stuff we know is what is said in dialogue. If a character doesn't say it or do it, we have no damn clue. So we're reading plays the way we would read a novel. We're looking for a storyline. We're looking to understand what the characters are doing. That's fine for your first read, right? What is the story? Who are these people? But your second read, your third, your fourth, your fifth read, those are doing this shit. This is a very, very polite, version of what I do. My scripts look insane, and they have like weird scribbles of like, I wonder what this means. When I look to the sky, it looks like this. Like it's dumb. But I tried to give you a nice version of it, so you know that when I read this, this is my second reading. What you're looking at is what would be considered my second reading notes, in which I identify physical and vocal characteristics. Those are things that are circled. Anything that's underlined is typically what is said about this character is said about another character or what the playwright says about that character. Does that make sense? So here I've done like a global view. This is not one character I've analyzed. I've gone through kind of picking out all of the things that I think are important to analyze. Um, but if you keep going, we find the inciting incident on page three. Creon plans to banish Medea. Citing incident. We already figured out what our exposition was because the nurse wouldn't shut up about it. She's a very long monologue at the beginning because she has to explain Greek mythology to an entire audience. So by page three, we already know what the inciting incident is. Typically, by halfway through act one, scene one, you should know what the inciting incident is. There are very few instances I can think of. Mm, Taming of the Shoe is probably one where you don't get the inciting incident until like scene three or four. Because that, that's a play within the play, that beginning part? Yeah. That's, a, that's an odd example. That is not typical. But typically, act one, scene one, definitely in Shakespeare by act one, scene two, you have figured out what the hell the play is about. You have given, you've been given the inciting incident. If you go to page four, this one's crazy. If you look at all of the circled things, you'll find vocal and physical perspectives. Go inside now. <laughs> Now you know where to go. But the most annoying part of it is that she goes, no, wait, come back. Go now. You have to figure out what she really means to go now. From within the house, where does Medea start to play? <laughs> From within the house. She ha that tells you a few things as an actor, practically. In the house, typically, not for our production, because I put them on a very dangerous tower um, with the upside down stairs. Um, they didn't really say anything. <laughs> anyway. They were uh, fine with it. Um, what it means is, from within inside the house, Medea has to be screaming and moaning so much that behind these two big double doors, you can hear her. That already gives you a vocal quality and understanding of how Medea is entering the room. She's screaming before you even see her. She's loud. Medea can't come out like, guys, I've had a rough day. She has to come out like dick swinging. She is ready to beat the shit out of people. If she doesn't start that way, which is even crazier, right? She can't start at a 10. She has to work up to her 10. So if she's starting at a three, what is her three and how does she build to a 10 if from the beginning, she's like, I hate all of you. There are a couple of things you can play with. Does her rage become, like my rage is scary when I'm quiet. Right? Like, that's like when I'm trying to keep it all in, it's when you're like, oh shit, Lee about to lose it. That's an option for how you understand starting in a three and getting to a 10. We often think of it as building in terms of shouting, yelling, when we build to the climax. I would argue it's much, much scarier for her to be her calmest self. If that's her 10, scary as shit. Also, like when uh, young actors love to cry, they always want to cry on stage. <laughs> and my argument to them constantly is, would you rather watch someone cry or would you rather watch someone try not to cry? Trying not to cry might be the most interesting thing I've ever seen in my life. There are biological things that are happening when you're trying not to cry that you can't like deal, there's the whole lump in your throat. 
your whole body goes to cry and you have to like, <laughs> like not do it. The same is true for anger. If I just scream and yell at you, there's an end game to how scary that is. If I am holding it in the whole time, you are anticipatorily waiting for me to explode. So I got you in the palm of my hand. Same is true for whenever you're holding back tears. I got you in the palm of my hand. If I'm the actor holding back tears and everyone's like, she's gonna do it. She's gonna cry at any second. They're right here. And then you play them like a fiddle. I mean, Jesus, once you have them, it's not hard. If you get them, it's really difficult to lose them. As long as you're following what the structure is of the story. Because again, that's what they're expecting. Yes, no, maybe? Um, so I've done, like, I've done eight billion of these. Crying, shouting. <laughs> Medea is howling, fierce temper, stretches. This is the best one. Your physicality is given to you on page four in the difference in hierarchy between the slaves and the masters. The nurse says, middle of the page, always they want power over others. They stretch their heads high. She's speaking about people of great status. When she goes to, and in the awful winds, they ride like trees, snapping and falling. The little things, we're talking about slaves, know how to bend without breaking. It tells me that Medea exists here. She is a full spine, head up, head held high. This bitch does not stoop. What it tells me about the nurse, that she lives here. Now I can do shit with these postures all day. These are psychological gestures. Michael Chekhov makes the argument that psychological gesture involves the spine. That all of, all of our impulses physically are derived from the spine. If that's true, the manipulation of the spine is how we find physical traits. The nurse tells us this on the third damn page, fourth damn page, of the play. So you already have physical characteristics before anything else has started. All gleaned from stretch their heads high, bend without breaking. Two remarkably small, not even full lines. And now I know how Medea sounds. I know that the nurse has been moaning to the gods. I know that the nurse, in comparison to Medea physically, has a different physical picture. And already we've answered 900 questions that would have taken four weeks in rehearsal for you to find in rehearsal. Instead, you find these things before you come, and now your directors, Mike, myself, all the other directors that exist in here, now I got something to work with because you've made a choice, a remarkably specific choice. Yeah? So let's keep going. The next things are things that I find whenever I'm either walking while reading the script. I'm a big fan of, of walking your set. I talk about mini set all the time. I'm a very big fan of mini set. So for example, if you're in your living room and you know the setup is similar to your stage, right? Like this is the, your couch is the bed, the coffee table is the desk. And I will physically walk my blocking with my lines on my mini set. Mm, sorry, I can't stop burping because I'm gonna drink a Red Bull about it. Um, I'm a big fan of vocalizing and saying all of your lines out loud over and over and over again. One reason is rate of speed. Rate of speed might be the best, second best, way to analyze your script and understand how where you are versus where someone else is. The best example is in Sophocles. If you look at the Sophocles, I believe it's on, it'll say page 10 in the top left-hand corner. Sophocles in Antigone does something markedly different than every other messenger speech in Grecian tragedy. Typically, except for this play, I can think of no other play that does this, except for in Antigone, every messenger comes in out of breath. It's like a whole part of it. They'll talk, if you look in, um, if you look in Medea, you'll find when the messenger comes to tell Medea that Glaus and Creon are big dead. The whole thing is about how fast he ran, about how out of breath he is. Medea spends a lot of time saying, Take a breath, catch your breath. Oh, well, I'm not Medea. Yes, yeah, I'm talking about Medea. Now I'm talking about Antigone, sorry. I was like, I'm getting it messed up. However, in Antigone, the messenger takes his time. 
He doesn't run to tell Creon that the body of, I believe it's a Teocles. Which one gets buried? I think it's a Teocles. Anyway, I got it messed up the whole time we did the play, so I can't help you. Um, either way, one of the brothers has been buried. A little bit of dust and dirt has been spread over one of the brothers. And it's a, that's a huge offense. This is an offense against Creon. This is an offense against Thebes. This is a big problem that someone defied the king. And the messenger is sent to tell Creon this. If every other messenger speech is running, screaming, and yelling, oh my God, mistress, I had to tell you this. But Creon's doesn't. That already pricks my, my little feelers. Because it says something about Creon. He says in the speech, I didn't want to come here. I didn't want to tell you. I took my time. I know I should have run, but I didn't. And I begged the gods to make sure I didn't have to say this. What it tells us about Creon, people are afraid to tell him the truth. That is a through line that plays throughout that entire play. In fact, the only person who ever tells Creon the truth is Antigone. The only one who has the nuts to say, what you're doing is wrong, this is disgusting, and I'll die about it. Like, I don't have to put up with this shit. I don't have to follow your rules. It says so much about Creon and so much about the messenger because the messenger represents all of the soldiers in Thebes. No one wants to tell him the truth. And in fact, he won the lottery of deciding who was going to go tell him the truth. This is why I bring you to rate of speed. If you look at Creon's lines, this is, and this is just a visual thing that I do often. If you look at Creon's lines in this scene, you'll see he says very little in comparison to the messenger. The messenger talks way more than Creon does. Also, if I were the messenger, knowing this information that people are afraid to tell Creon the truth, I might just vomit it out. I might just, sir, I am here, I can't say I'm out of breath. I have, I have not exactly been running on light feet. I halted many times along the road so I could think. If he clips along, and look at all, I'm a big fan of consonants. It's like the most actor thing you can be a fan of. But I'm a big fan of consonants because they always tell you what the clip is. If there are a shitload of vowels, that person speaks very slowly. There is a, a honey, drippy, syrupy thing to their lines. But if they have a shitload of consonants, especially hard consonants at the end, T's, K's, right, those kind of like snappy lines, it tells you that character speaks more quickly. And now you have something to play. Because if I'm Creon, I'm taking my sweet time to say everything I want. I'm relishing this. I'm getting exactly what I want. So playing the consonants, playing with rate of speed, when should you speed up or slow down? Consonants and vowels are typically a good leader for you in that way. If they're vowels, you're going a little bit slower. If they're consonants, we're clipping it along. I also pay attention to, if you look at Mary Wives of Windsor, which is the last one, I have, I played this role, so forgive me that I played the role. If you look at, first of all, it's a direct address. It's remarkably different than the nurse screaming to the gods. It is a joke that Mistress Page has with the audience. And then it says, reads. Now, young actors will attempt to just read the letter. Just so we're on the same page. In no way, shape, or form did Shakespeare think you were just going to read a damn letter. The, one of the greatest playwrights of all time wasn't like, and now, here's what reading is like. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. But if instead, you can clip some of this stuff along, especially this first one. You are not young. No more am I. Go then to their sympathy. You are merry. So am I. Ha ha, then there's more sympathy. You love sack and so do I. Would you deserve better sympathy? You can clip along between those pieces that he says. So if he says, dur, 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 you are not young, no more am I. I would pause right after that. That's what a slash means. Go to then their sympathy. Clips along. You are merry. So am I. Ha ha, then there's more sympathy. It's about a beat. This is in prose, so um, it's way easier. 
I chose Mary Wives of Windsor specifically. Um, I hate iambic. I'm just not going to lie about it. Um, I, I do. I hate it. I hate the idea that you have to like figure it out. It's not that hard. If you read it and it sounds stupid, read it different. <laughs> I mean, is, any, is anyone arguing with that? The second you read it, you go, that sounds dumb. And then you read it a different way, you go, there it is. And it'll also find a rhythm of its own. And if you just find the rhythm, you're fine. I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> Do not show this to Richard Perloff. Um, <laughs> hey, Rich. Uh, um, I would have wore a cuter outfit. Um, also notice, <laughs> if you go to night, <laughs> the worst, night, night, light, might, fight. Says a couple of things about Falstaff. One, he's stupid. He's stupid. That was his version of a poem. That tells you so much about him, and it gives the actress playing Mistress <coughs> Page 7,000 things to do with that. Because if you go, I say not, I, I will not say pity me, tis not a soldier-like phrase, but I say love me, by me, that means he wrote this poem, by me, thine own true knight, by day or night, or any kind of light, with all his might, for thee to fight. John Falstaff. You give the actress an opportunity to hate this man more, which is what we as an audience need for any of the jokes to make sense. If Mistress Page and Mistress, what's the other one? Catherine Plater. Ford. Mistress Ford. Um, if Mistress Page and Mistress Ford don't spend the whole time being unimpressed by Fal Mike Clay Falstaff. I keep pointing to him like you guys know that. Mike Clay Falstaff, I play Mistress Page. Um, <laughs> Chuck if, also attended the play. Chuck was in the play. Hi, Chuck. Shut up, Mike. <laughs> I want you to point at other people. <laughs> no, I'm going to be sure. I'm doing all of it to you now. In fact, this workshop is just for you. <laughs> the playwright is gone. You're going to, I should have never said that. <laughs> what a mess. Um, I'm sorry, alchemy. <laughs> um, if, if we understand that separation, right, that Mistress Page and Mistress Ford they are going to spend the whole show making fun of John Falstaff. We in the audience then get to participate. If instead we're like hardcore bullying him and he's actually a really lovely guy, there's no comedy therein. We hardcore bully him and he's an idiot, a drunkard, and like a little kind of slutty, really. Right? Just like Mike Murdoch. <laughs> who is 55 years old. <laughs> Significantly older than me. Um, also, punctuation. I'm a huge fan of punctuation. Punctuation tells you everything you need to know. At the end, she says, what Herod of Jewry is this? Which is a rough line, really. <laughs> Hard line to start on. But there is an exclamation point at that, and then at the end of Oh, Wicked World. Now, I don't think she's screaming like a banshee what Herod of Jewry is this? Oh, wicked, like she's not bemoaning anything. If instead, she's surprised. An exclamation point is more than anger. An exclamation point is surprise. Like one, this man wrote this and sent it to me. That's hilarious. That's a big surprise. And then also, <laughs> sorry, I keep laughing about Mike, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry, Mike. Oh, wicked world. She's not bemoaning the world. Not me. It's like, oh, the world is so wicked. Like, the fact that this man was put into my life is messed up. That's the wicked world we're talking about. She's not bemoaning the fact that she received a love letter from a moron. This is any girl who's ever had social media. <laughs> um, they're fun. It also tells us more stuff about... Falstaff, because we've met Falstaff. We've already, by this time in the play, we've met Falstaff, we have a good understanding, you know, he's kind of a douche. It's not until this that she really goes hard on him, because there's stuff we don't know until we get to her reading the letter. The letter essentially becomes rising action, because the inciting incident is the bet. The inciting incident is, I, I feel like I can trick these ladies, and they'll give me some, like, we'll get married, and I'll get their stuff, right? Like, that's, that's the inciting incident. The rising action is she receives this letter. This is the beginning of him actually doing it. Yeah? Um, you'll see that she says, worn to pieces with age, <laughs> um, drunkard, 
He sees himself as a young gallant. If that doesn't say so much about Falstaff, I don't know what does. Everyone else describes him as a drunken piece of shit, but he sees himself as a young gallant. It gives the character playing Falstaff nine billion things to do. If you are blissfully unaware that you are an idiot, you can do anything you want and we'll find it funny. I didn't hear that one, but I'm sure it's good. Congress. Oh, Congress. I thought you were saying someone we knew. I thought it was tea. I didn't think it was like yeah. that. <laughs> no, I was ready for the tea. I was there. That's what I was like, yes. And then you said Congress. I said, whatever. Um, <laughs> issues. <laughs> so glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> you also, <clears throat> sorry, I keep burping up. I really keep burping up. And then I drink it more. I'm sorry. Um, da -da 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 -da. She says revenged twice. Revenge on him, for revenge I will be. I would play the shit out of the word revenge. I would play that V. Revenged on him, revenged I shall be. It spits it out of your mouth. That's part of that playing the consonants. I'm also a big fan of making words sound like what they are. Air, fire. Does that make sense? By playing just one or two of the vowels or consonants in a word suddenly colors that word in a much different way and adds then to the characterization you can expect to find just by identifying words in which you're playing the vowel or you're playing the consonant and then making them sound like what they are. If we're talking about fire, we're not talking about fire, <laughs> just a little fire. You're talking about something that you could make it sound like what it is. There's a fullness to it. Yes, no, maybe? Great. Um, blah, blah, blah. punction away. Oh, I'm a huge fan of alliteration. If alliteration takes place, you are meant to play that alliteration, specifically in Shakespeare's work, definitely in Greek tragedians. They did the beautiful thing about Shakespeare that we can't say about contemporary playwrights. There are no coincidences in Shakespeare's work. It's not like happily he came to this idea that we'll use alliteration here. The alliteration is used for something very specific. Or any time, uh, there's another one in here. I'm sure I'll find it after this is over. Um, in the Antigone script, there isn't alliteration, but there are similar descriptive words that build upon themselves. It showed no marks, no spade scratches, no pickaxe holes, not even chariot ruts. A list is not a list. A list is not eggs, milk, bread, sugar. That's not the kind of list we're doing. If there's a list in a play, it builds on itself. No marks, no spade scratches, no pickaxe holes, not even chariot ruts. It follows an intention. A list is never a list. Also, I like all of those because they, a lot of them have really good consonants at the end. Ruts. You can play ruts. Anything, uh, 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 pickaxe. That's something you can play. It'll also tell you about rate of speed. If there are a bunch of shitload of long words together, uh-uh, you're not meant to clip that along. One, because your audience is not gonna be with you, right? If it's like, uh, 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 oh, I just proposed the love song of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, in the love song of J. Robert Oppenheimer, it's about J. Robert Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. And there is a ton of scientific language in that play so that you can, as an audience, understand more about how the atom bomb worked. And in those pieces, I mean, I'm talking a whole section that is explaining how this kind of technology works. If that actor clips through that with the kind of acuity that Oppenheimer himself would have had, he invented the goddamn thing. Do you know what I'm saying? He would rattle it off. The same way I could rattle, like if someone were said, what's the definition of acting? Living truthfully within a set of imaginary given circumstances. I can vomit it out. Right, a taming of the shrew monologue, which is also not surprising. I can vomit it. Because I'm so, I know all about it. I've lived my whole life doing this. J. Robert Oppenheimer in real life would have rattled this science off. But again, not real life. These people, if they don't understand it, they don't give a shit. So you have to slow it down when the words demand you do so. Yes, no, kinda? 
Um, let me see what else I have for you. Oh, I'm a big, I, I talk about this all the time. If you've ever taken my acting class, you've heard this 450 billion times. Operative word. In every single line, in every single play, in the history of humanity, every single line has an operative word, meaning the word in that sentence which gives that sentence context. So I always use the line, I want to go to the store. An emphasis on each different word in that sentence makes the sentence mean something different. I want to go to the store, not Joanna. I want to go. I want to go to the store. I don't need to go to the store. I want to. I want to go to the store. I want to go to the store. I want to go to the store, not the pharmacy, not, I don't know, name some, a restaurant. I want to go to the store. So if you can find your operative words in every single line, again, this is all just script analysis. You haven't Googled anything at this point in this imaginary scenario where you're working on these three plays at the same time, um, which is a weird season. <laughs> um, if you can find operative word, you all, now you know what you're saying, and you'll know you're wrong in the same way if you do iambic pentameter, and it sounds weird, <laughs> say it another way. Um, pick a different operative. If, if it sounds weird, if it doesn't connect to what the next person is saying. If Akia said, Leah, I wanna go to the pharmacy. I would say, I wouldn't go, I want to go to the store. <laughs> We'd be like, what is wrong with you? Instead, I would go, I wanna go to the store because it's direct response to what she just said to me. So when you switch your operatives, and sometimes it's a couple, I mean, especially in Shakespeare's work, you're gonna find three or four operatives in one stanza, and you have to play that. <laughs> but you'll know instantly if, it's wrong, if you get it wrong, because it will sound stupid. And the, if you're just letting yourself be the thing that, that rides this, right? Like that you have the ability to know when it sounds stupid and when it doesn't. That you have the ability <coughs> to make those changes in real time all before you ever meet me as a director, you do this. I mean, that's my expectation as a, as a director, that you've done this stuff before you even see me. Because if you haven't, you've now taken your artistry and gone, here, Leah, I have nothing in this. I have no artistry of my own. Please do whatever you want. When you come in with nothing, that's what you're saying to me as a director. You're asking me to treat you as a puppet because you've done nothing in your own artistry to make your own decisions. And then the worst part is, when those actors, I, I hate actors who only do the work in, in rehearsal room, because that's where you test it out. This isn't where we are doing, you're not sitting here going operative, like it's not 10 minutes before rehearsal and you're finding operative words. You've already done this. You test out those operative words here. This is where you find out, you've said them and you think, I think this is the one. And you go into the rehearsal room and you'll know instantly if Chuck says back to me something crazy that doesn't follow my operative, I'll know, he and I will both know instantly. Just like Akia was like, girl, that's not how, not. I said, I want to go. <laughs> um, she knew instantly, we both knew it was wrong. We could feel that it was wrong. I didn't need Mike to tell me as a director. We felt that. And instead of Mike having to spend his valuable time or my valuable time, any director's valuable time going, let's go over your operative words. You as actors already know that. So here's the permission I know you all ask for to make your own decisions. Actors crave, I mean, we, we like to be liked. We like to be right. We like that. We want that. And often we're really, really afraid to go out on a limb because we're afraid it's gonna make people not like us. If you, what if you make a decision and Mike disagrees? That's called theater. That then becomes a conversation between the director and the actor. It's not now like, he doesn't like it, I'll never do it again, I'll die here. Instead, it's a conversation about like, okay, well, what are you thinking? Here's what I was thinking. And then now we have a conversation and our artistry is shared. We are actively collaborating. If I don't come in with that work, he has nothing to work with me on. And now I'm being micromanaged across a stage and then sometimes actors halfway through the rehearsal process will want to change the game. They'll go, hey, yeah, 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 I get it now. Uh, I've made some decisions. You're too late to the game, babe. We're ass deep in this play. You can't come now and have feelings and thoughts. Where the hell were you day one? If we're three weeks in, I ain't changing shit. 
This is who you said you were. We just spent three weeks figuring out this character, me running you around the stage like a puppet. And now suddenly you're an actor? Nah. We're moving forward the way we have been. So if you get left behind, that's on you. That's also a part of the personal responsibility of actors. If it's a bad play, and people you love say it's a bad play, you as actors will say the director sucked. If you're wondering if it's a bad play and you're the director, say the actor sucked. <laughs> That's the game. And so instead, if you are taking control of your own artistry, like there are plenty of times where I haven't been happy with an actor's performance in one of my plays. Plenty of times. One very specific I'm thinking of right now. There have been plenty of times that that has happened. But if I have stuck to my artistry, if I have done everything I could in my power to get this play where it needed to be, I feel no sense of obligation. I feel no sense that I've messed up the entire play because that's a, a, an, an incorrect understanding of what it is we do. Actors believe that the directors know everything. We know nothing. You are how we know. When you bring something to the table, I go, I never thought of it that way. You will change something for me that I would have never thought of before because you brought something to the table and now we're moving. Now we together are making decisions. So that if it is a bad play, it's all of our fault. We all did this. <laughs> it's much harder to blame someone else if you've worked in collaboration with them the whole time because you've made the, the part isn't just yours. It's shared with your director. And if it isn't like that, you might have a shitty director, but you might be a shitty actor. Because instead of thinking of all of us and thinking of how this play builds upon our mutual collaboration and respect of what we are doing and how we move the story forward, because we all understand what the climax is and we know where we're going, then we as a team fail or win. And if we fail, it's just information for next time. And there are some people who won't collaborate. There are plenty of directors in this town who will marionette you across the stage with no action. And, you're, and some people are like, mm-hmm, happy to do it. I'm over here now. They, have, they don't care, right? Like, it's fine. This, you're going to find directors who are not going to want to collaborate with you, who are going to say, this is the character. That's when you do some undercover shit and make your own decisions. And remember, this is a mean thing to say as a director, uh, you the only one on stage at the end of the day. I've gotten plenty of direction I thought was horse shit. And then the play started and I did what I wanted. Uh, it's true, I'm not gonna, I've had plenty of directors who didn't, didn't help me at all, worked actively against me or other actors in the play. And so, you know, I told him what he wanted to hear <laughs> until performance. And then I did whatever the hell I wanted to do. That's the risk you run with actors. That's the risk you run. Y'all are going to do what you want to do. If I'm sitting back there and you're ruining my play, there's nothing I can do. I've been in that situation a billion times. There's nothing I can do. Because at the end of the day, it all falls on you. All of it. What happens here is your responsibility. And so, yeah, maybe that director didn't like me. They hired me again, though. <laughs> um, and I did exactly the same thing. And I can apply to everything except Bright Star next weekend. Yes, whatever they say about the play, do what's been asked of you. <laughs> but also, they can't stop. <laughs> um, they're not going to stop the play. I'm just saying we're on the same. <laughs> and this is the last time Leah spoke. <laughs> right, and then they were like, and Leah never came back to alchemy again. <laughs> um, that's. That's the long and the short of it. Thoughts? Good, no thoughts, great. That's good. Nothing, okay, good. I'll just kill myself after this. Um, oh, I'm joking. Um, anything that I said that popped for you or made you think of something differently or do you read scripts like this? Is this how you're reading a script? Is this far away from what you do? Is it close to what you do? Yes. Oh, I just want to say the whole thing about like you do your own work outside of rehearsal. Hell yes. Where you test it out. Yeah. That's, I mean, 
pretty much I sit on this? like a year or so ago. Most of what I've done is high school theater. Yeah. And that just we never really talked about that. Yeah, they can't talk to y'all about shit in high school because we can't talk to y'all like you're real people. Yeah. Amen. We can't talk to you like you're real people. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> yeah. We can't have. A, I'm sorry. I'm messing with this mic. I'm sorry. Um, we can't talk to you about anything. And the other thing is, the majority of the canon of of not only contemporary American theater but the canon of theater across centuries is inappropriate for people under the age of 18. Now, I would argue it's not inappropriate at all, but like in terms of the authorities, <laughs> it is inappropriate. Um, but I mean, you know, I, I was reading Medea. I was doing like remarkably weird work when I was in high school. Um, and even then, there's just no space for this kind of work. This is a conservatory idea. This is something you don't you don't really start talking about until you're in a BFA or MFA. It's not something that anyone ever brings up to you because in high school they're like, you can't do anything really in this play anyway, right? There are not a lot of plays where they're gonna let y'all kiss. They're not, a, you know, they're not gonna talk about sex. God forbid a curse word comes out, right? They're not gonna let you do any of the things that are ingrained in who we are as humans. You don't get to do that stuff until you're old enough to, to make your decisions about, about what you want to do. Yeah? Yeah. What else? I think one of the challenges with a lot it's of these things, here. because that does happen naturally, I think, for some people, Yeah. that they read it that way. Yes. Um, even Rye, who's very into this, when came in for auditions, he was like, I need to read about this character. Yes. Out. Not knowing just from the scripts, but. I think the hard thing for someone who is newer to Shakespeare or coming back to Shakespeare is yeah. the language. Is the there are so many words that Shakespeare uses that yeah. we don't use anymore. Yeah. So it, it kind of becomes a, a study in what those words meant then. Fair. I would say this. One, the hardest part about the language is your mouth doing it. That's the hardest part. The hardest part is wrapping your mouth around these large ideas, like, no shame but mine, I must forsooth be forced to give my hand opposed against my heart unto a mad brain rude, right? Like, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but you have to get it in there. The reason, the reason Shakespeare is so easy to remember is that it follows a rhythmic pattern. And so if you find the rhythm, if you find the pattern, if you can wrap your mouth around those words, I don't know that you do need to know what any of them mean. Because through context clues, we'll figure it out anyway. I mean, the idea that the first people to see Shakespeare, who the majority of which were poor as hell, it was a penny to be one of the groundlings, they weren't exactly rocket scientists. So how the hell did they understand it, but we don't? And worse, they were listening to it. They couldn't even see the damn stage. It was at eye level. They were just listening to these words. If they could do it, what is it that we can't do? And so I always go back to the rhythm. I always go back to figure out how to pronounce the words and then figure out how the hell they go together. Everything else is just context to make us feel better because we want to know what words mean. <laughs> that's, uh, that's humans, right? We want to know, like, what the hell am I saying here? But I would argue through context clues, through rhythm, through clip of speech, through alliteration, any of those kinds of things, which, again, are in the script, that you'll figure it out one way or the other. Kind of, because I mean, the first—I think the first Shakespeare play I ever saw was *Romeo and Juliet*, which is literally the worst Shakespeare to be your first Shakespeare play. It sucks. *Romeo and Juliet* sucks. <laughs> um, the nurse is the best character. Friar Lawrence is the second best character. Um, anyway, I didn't know anything about the story. I mean, I think I was in the fifth grade, and I would like talk my parents into just dropping me off at these places to go see plays. I don't know; um, they weren't all that concerned about my safety. Um, but I would just go see these random plays. And it was a bad production of Romeo and Juliet. Let me start by saying that. It was a bad production. And, and I don't know that anyone on stage knew the hell, what the hell they were saying. But it was so easy for me to understand. One, they show you. Say they were speaking Japanese. You're looking at it. Do you know what I mean? Like, this one's mad at that one. They're wearing the same colors. Those are probably related people. They're wearing different colors. They're not on the same team. That, um, we show it to you. And so a lot of this understanding of, I don't know what the words mean, well, then neither does your audience. Mm -hmm. And so instead of worrying about what the words mean, make sure they understand the story, which from my perspective is physical and vocal. 
the only things you take on stage with you are your body, your voice, and the words in your head. That's it. Everything else is horse shit. Talking and listening, all this Meisner horse shit nonsense. It is just a way for actors to feel like they're doing something. You're doing nothing. Like character, history, I can't, I would rather die than hear somebody's character history. It is just an example. Today for breakfast, he had, it's like no one gives a shit what Medea had for breakfast. And if Medea's on stage worrying about what she had for breakfast, we are in the shit. Cause she ain't acting if she's doing that. Right, she ain't doing nothing. Those kinds of things only serve to make us feel like we're doing something. And my argument constantly is, you writing your imagined character history of what happened to Willie Loman prior to the opening of Death of a Sale. It's like so stupid. And it only feeds us like, we're so artistic. This is what I came up with. This is how creative I am. It's like, you're not that creative. I can make up what breakfast any of you had. I can make up a whole story about Chuck's day and it won't do anything. It will be helpful to 0.0% .0 people. <laughs> Does that help at all? Mm -hmm. it, take, it should take some of the pressure off, mm -hmm. is what I think. I think if, if, if what I say is true, if everything is in the script, then all you have to do is know how to read and you're in. But we like to make it complicated. One, we want people to think that what we do is really hard. And it isn't. I mean, it might be hard to fund. It might be frustrating sometimes. I've hit Mariah with a car one time. It can be dangerous. <laughs> Um, Lauren split open his whole knee. I mean, we were looking at bone. It was disgusting. That happened in a play. That happened in us putting the show together. But what we do, performance, that's not hard. It can be exhausting. It can be frustrating. But it's not hard. It's not rocket science. We're not engineers up there. We're pretending. And the more you can lean into the idea that you're pretending, well, then it's fun. Children pretend. Children play. All I ever want for my actors is to play. That's it. That's all it is. And if there's any like emotional turmoil about that, stop it. You just want to feel like an artist. And no one knows what an artist feels like. So we all do what we think popular culture believes artistry is. And in truth, I think artistry is imagination unabashed imagination, so imaginary that you believe it. You've built such a world. I spit everywhere. You have built such a world, an imaginary world for yourself that you believe it. So strengthen your, I'm a big fan of strengthening your imagination. I would ask each of you to think about how you imagine, which is a weird thing. There's very little research done on the imagination because it is so difficult to understand how it works, what are the processes by which imagination takes place. Because it's different than dreams. We understand a lot about dreams. We can chart dreams. We know when you're dreaming. It is very hard to understand when the human mind is imagining. And so I would ask you, is your imagination in color? Is it in black and white? Does it move like a film? Is it stock like a bunch, like a slideshow of pictures? Does it include sound? Does it include scent? In what ways could you strengthen your imagination? And if instead of worrying about your own emotional life, you could worry about your imaginary life, now we've also taken out the very dangerous part of acting, which is your own emotional life. I'm not a fan of using your own emotional life in your work. It's dangerous and it's stupid, and your emotions are unreliable. I know this because every single person in this room has fallen in love or had a crush on someone you shouldn't have. That in your brain you knew, that. Uh -uh. I'm not messing with this dude. But your heart said, let's do it. <laughs> your emotions are unreliable. Your emotions are not replicable. And that's what theater is. If you can't replicate it, if you can't give yourself the motivation to have these experiences on stage every single night, then you're not really a theater actor at all. Because the people who saw it on Wednesday, they're expecting to see that badass shit on Thursday. And if you're relying on your emotions, for me, <laughs> to make money, you're an idiot. But my body, I can trust my body. I can trust my voice. They're phys they're, they have a real, th I can look at them. They are malleable. I can't see my emotion. And I can manipulate myself, but what, what harm does that do to me, Leah Turley, a person? Because I am not just an artist and an actor. I am going to have to go out and live in the world. I, I tell everybody, Method acting is for privileged, wealthy, 
male actors. <laughs> That's who it's for. You will hear very seldomly of a bitch going method. But if Heath Ledger, which by the way, he paid for that. If Heath Ledger went around acting like the Joker for a nine month film, are you surprised though? There, but here's the other part. The whole team, the production team, the insurance company, everyone's like, yes, this is okay. Please act like a sociopath for nine months around all of us. This is totally fine. It's for his art. Those people failed that man because people told him that's what artistry was. The same thing is true as who's that idiot? The next one who played the Jared Leto, I could barf. <laughs> God, I hate Jared Leto so much. <laughs> He's a poser. Anyway, I hate him so much. You know, he was like, I'll do the same thing that Heath Ledger did. It worked out so well for him. And he played Method as the Joker. His performance sucked. And no one was like, oh good, Method Act, this is, uh, this is gonna turn out great. You sent dead rats to people? Send me a dead, uh, uh, I better not find your ass. <laughs> Method is not, if, if you came into my classroom, right, and you said, hey Leah, I'm Kate from Taming of the Shrew. Everyone call me Kate, everyone act like I'm Kate. We'd be like, bitch, get out. Get out of this classroom and come back when you're normal. That's what we would say to you. But Heath Ledger and Jaron Leno kicked the door in, big dick in, I'm method, and we all have to act like that's what acting is? That's what acting is for people who are emotionally masturbatory. They want, I, I have to be the character. No, you don't. You don't at all. And if they're like, how do I drop it? You stop pretending, you moron. We mean, how do I drop it? Stop <laughs> acting like that. I mean, if Mike Murdoch told us he was Falstaff, we would call the police. <laughs> and when the police came, they wouldn't go, where's Falstaff? They'd go, Mike Murdoch. <laughs> we are arresting your ass. It's acting for people who never had therapy. <laughs> so if you're one of those, and like you're emotionally wrought all the time, go see a therapist. Don't come to us for it. I am not a good therapist. Or qualified at all. I will bully you until you do what I want. <laughs> That's the therapy I can give you. But I mean, and he's not the only one. I mean, we hold up, what's that other guy I hate? Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis is also method. Beautiful productions, <laughs> but you mean to tell me we all have to deal with this guy being an asshole for nine months because it's his process? That's ridiculous. Watch Jim and Andy. If you haven't seen Jim and Andy, it's on Netflix. It is about Jim Carrey playing Andy Kaufman in Man on the Moon. Jim Carrey plays the character Method, meaning that he acts like Andy Kaufman. If you don't know who Andy Kaufman is, uh, he was a psycho. I mean, I don't know what the nice way to I don't know if there are Andy Kaufman fans out there. Uh, um, you can't be under the age of 40, I know that. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, it, like Mike. Um, Andy Kaufman acted like an ass. I mean, he did absolutely outrageous things. Um, he would go on uh, talk shows as a different character. Uh, Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix tried to do this um, when he pretended to be a rapper for some reason and we all had to act like that was fine. Um, who was I telling you about? Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Um, watch it because Jim Carrey plays at Method and he runs a, an antique car into a brick wall that was for the production because that's what Andy would do. Let me tell you the most disgusting part of the whole thing is Andy Kaufman never got to meet his daughter. He died before meeting his daughter. And so Andy Kaufman's real daughter and real living parents come to the set of Man on the Moon and calls Jim Carrey dad. They have conversations as if they are father and daughter. Because acting, what are you talking about? That is disgusting and manipulative and has nothing to do with artistry. It's a way for Jim Carrey to emotionally masturbate all over a play, all over a movie and for us to go, oh, let's watch it, I guess. I think that's all I have to bitch about. <laughs>